Investing insights with Right Property Group. Exploring trends in real estate and helping property investors gain financial security. Oh, good everyone. How are you going? Phil Town here, co-host of Investing Insights with the Right Property Group. I'm with Steve Waters and Victor Kumar. These two gentlemen are directors of the Right Property Group and the co-hosts of this particular podcast. These are the guys, the men on the spot. They know what's going on. Gentlemen, how are you going? I'm going great, Phil. Good to be back. Now, I've been told over many years uh, by you guys that um, property is a great asset class because it goes up in value and uh, you've got this magical thing called leverage which allows you to borrow to support the capital growth you get and then one day you can liquidate it all and retire on a beach, drink a pina colada somewhere. Now, something's wrong with the market at the moment now, Victor, because mm-hmm. cars are going up in value more <laughs> than property Yet on, the way, on right. the way to the beach well, to drink that? pina coladas <laughs> in a Bentley. Yeah. But you know, you know what I mean? Like you've always been told cars, car debt, car financing, bad debt, mm-hmm. mortgage debt, good debt, but cars are actually – Going up in value, they like going even up in like value. just you know, my my car's going up in yeah, value. But it's all Something supply and demand, isn't it? Yeah. So because there's less supply coming in, and people have got more disposable income, so the affordability is there, mm. and the reduction in supply is there, which then causes the prices to go up. So it's exactly the same as property, largely. It's pretty much the same as property. Yeah, yeah, anything, if you're, you know, oranges are in short supply. Uh, it'll go up in in value. Do you remember when bananas went to like yeah. ten? Was it ten, twelve dollars a kilo, kilo yeah. or whatever? And you had to actually pay a. A surcharge tax when you got your banana milkshake from the milk bar, Steve. Mm-hmm. When uh, that was before my time, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I never, don't, I never don't, remember don't. paying a surcharge for a banana don't, milkshake. Do you remember when bananas went? I do. Yeah, I do. That was after all the weather effects. Yeah, uh, far north, far north Queensland. But just coming back to the the car scenario mm. for a minute. Um, not for one second are we saying that it's an investment no. vehicle? No, no pun intended. And that just goes to show you the anomaly in our entire ecosystem mm-hmm. that we have today where other than collector's items, cars are going up in value or well, the secondhand mm. cars and the new cars for that matter. Certainly not an investment grade asset. Mm. And even if you do make a couple of dollars on the way out. You like, gotta replace that car. Won't because you? you bought the Bentley at, you know, <laughs> yeah. Half a million and now it's worth three quarters of a million, that uh it's still taking five times that away from your entire serviceability. Mm. That's a really good point. So but if you've got a loan on it. If you've got a loan on it. Yeah. So we're in like a bizarro world for for investing at the moment where cars go up in value and other things go up in value when traditionally they don't. Yeah. It's boats. Boats are going to value. You yeah. buy a boat, you can Caravans. Sell it. Caravans. But it's, so how long is this going to last? Well, see, I th- it's actually a really interesting point because the way I look at it is that none of this would have happened if COVID yeah. had not no. existed, mm-hmm. yeah? So it's a trend. And the trend will translate into data Mm -hmm. and there will be some people that hinge their future on that component. And take that as gospel. Of the data, correct. Where really it's just a moment in time and that's the difference between Mm -hmm. being an investor in no matter what the asset class is or a speculator. Yeah, so you you look at data as just a guide, right? Because you need to dive in deeper into that to say, okay, what's causing the data? Is it very transient? In this case, if you talk cars, very transient, right? Once normality returns- the cars would reset to its normal caravans, as an example. Once we start being able to go overseas, caravans may not be as popular, and therefore uh, it'll be less expensive. Mm. You know, the interesting thing is here, as you speak about cars, even though this is a property podcast, I remember I used to have a a, a v, VN Commodore way, way, way back, and I saw one sell the other day for seventy five thousand dollars when I yeah. bought mine for like eight. I should have hung on to it. You should have. You should have put it on blocks in your garage. <laughs> It was probably on blocks in your garage as you stole my rims. <laughs> I, I once upon a time, let's go back. I, I, I bought a Mark I Escort, mint condition, right? Like uh, it's when I was back when I was a student and um, at my other car, I, I blew a Conrad in it from doing too many burnouts, right? So I actually had to go and get a car as an emergency because I delivered pizzas, right? So <laughs> You see, now, this is where we're getting the backstory. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, so I had to get a car. So I went through the trading post and it had – Escort, you know, seven hundred dollars or somewhere. Other went okay. That sounds like the car to me. Went went to Parramatta or to Harris Park actually. Bought this car, immaculate, immaculate Mark One Escort. I said to the lady, "Look, I'm only giving you six hundred bucks through the money adder. Got the rego papers, drove off right, throwing doilies out. There, you know, like <laughs> some old lady's car. That car today would be worth an absolute mint, absolute mint. I just <laughs> I flogged it to an instant's life until it also blew up. 
and that was the end of it. But and should have put that on blocks in my garage. Well, you could have along with yeah. your other collection of four runners and there you go, Audis. But that's not the smart investor. They don't go around collecting things like this. No, do I they? think we've just lost half our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's got a backstory. But but what I'm getting at is all these myths at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. No one knows what's going on. Markets operating in complete opposite of the way they should be operating, cars, for example. So we all know right now that property is is booming along, and I hate using the word booms. We're not uh, we're not in the tabloids here, Victor. Mm-hmm. We, we like to keep things pretty measured and sensible, which we have been right through uh, COVID-19. So what you're seeing right now probably won't last forever, and a lot of people making assumptions on perceived facts about how they're going to operate and how they're going to buy and be effective in this market. So this particular podcast, gents, I wanted to get into the, the myths. I want to bust some myths about operating in this current market and how to do well in hot markets and not be those people who are going to blow all their dough or end up in the wrong end when this market does run out of steam, which it will do, and we get back to some level of normal. So you guys like myth busting, don't you? Myth busting? <laughs> <What>? Myth busting? <laughs> <laughs> These are the fall off. Myth busting. Can you say myth busting real fast? Ten times. Myth busting. No. Yeah, give it a go. Yeah. No, I, I get more fun yeah. out of listening to you myth, say it. Myth. Let's bust some myths, Victor. <laughs> sure. What, are you picking on me? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just, uh, you know, um, really um, appreciating your Aussie accent. Oh, really? And, um, you know, if, if it was me not being able to pronounce a word, that would be acceptable. Right? Yeah. You yeah, must really? have had a big weekend. Uh, no, I didn't actually. I was, uh, <laughs> I was looking at property all weekend on the interweb. His tongue Chicken is swollen out. from too much salt on his Chico rolls. Yeah, probably. yeah that's what it was. Yeah. It's all that French champagne I drink, Steve. You know, it's um, mm. it's it's the way up. Let's bust some myths, guys. <laughs> Myth number one. Victor, I'm going to start with you because Steve looks like about to have a cardiac arrest. And you know you're on the video here as well. I am now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All property goes up in value at the same speed. Biggest myth around. Biggest, Biggest myth, around. myth around. Yeah. But everyone's saying you just need to be in this market, so it doesn't matter where, just chuck it in and it's all going to go up in value. No, it- that, that tends to be qualified. You need to be in the market that suits your circumstances mm. and not assume that everything will be rosy and go your way throughout the whole journey, right? So it's not buy today and it'll be worth – you know, 50,000 more tomorrow. It goes through its process and it depends on what you're buying, where you're buying and what the cycle is in that suburb, in that. So if you look at cycles, right? So you have a overall figure that the data spits out to say that, okay, Sydney is going up by 7% as an example, just making these numbers up. Yeah, Sydney is going up by 7%. Yet you buy in a suburb in Sydney that may not go up by 7% because understanding that the 7% figure that they've come up with is an average figure that amalgamates all of the data and picks a number to say, on average, Sydney is going up by 7% a year. right? And if you're buying in a particular suburb, you're thinking and hoping that it'll go up by 7% once you've bought it, may not, may not pan out because the cycle within that suburb may be at its peak, even though Sydney as the state or the um, a metropolitan area is halfway up its cycle. So let's say it's at nine o'clock and peak being 12 o'clock. That particular suburb may already be at 12. So therefore, you're not going to make money straight away. Provided there's fundamentals in place, you will make your money medium to long term. Mm. And this is what we need to always look at is that property investing, short term, you do get your short term wins uh, and it's it's more timing and good luck and also being uh, very methodical and strategic in buying. But if you take that filter away and look at it from a general approach, you make your money medium to long term in property because there's a lot of in and out transactional cost as well. So this logic then of all property goes up in value at the same speed is a huge myth. And and you're talking about Sydney. Sydney's, I don't know how many properties are inside the Sydney Basin, but Mm -hmm. there's what? Nearing 4 million people now live in Sydney? Correct. That's a big old place. So if you look at generic or normalized growth patterns, Mm. Sydney from trough to peak generally goes three to five years. Now, that's just a a, a formula that or the data that shows that it has done that trend over the last couple of cycles, Mm. but that doesn't mean it'll translate in the next cycle. If you look at Brisbane as an example, your growth is not as spiky. It's more rounded. So your growth patterns from trough to peak, if you look at the last couple of cycles, has been 7 to 11 years. And so therefore, both markets are moving at different speeds. 
already just from the data then you need to drill down to say okay what is really happening with the property i'm looking at buying in this area and things that determine that is you know the liquidity in terms of rent liquidity in terms of sales volume what finance is uh, doing in the in the market and the general sentiment in there as well as you know maybe some news media articles about you know big infrastructure going in and all that people yeah. tend to dive into that and try and think of getting in early and riding it riding the wave up and hoping that it goes up in value so every single capital city market operates at different speeds from each other but inside each of the capital city markets all at different speeds um, I'd, I'd, most of the time, that would mm-hmm, be correct. Mm-hmm. But if we have a market today where all markets Everything are heading north. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the question to ask then is, and I think the March quarter in Sydney was like 7 or 8% growth, right, in, in one quarter. That's a big, That's not going to continue. But is there parts of Sydney which are going backwards or at least capped out in terms of growth? Uh, yeah, absolutely there is. But I think that will also come down to the type of asset it yeah. is. So whether it's in today's market, detached house plus land component versus you know investor stock or in, mm. in attached apartments mm. you know there's a very big gap in the growth patterns in that scenario and there probably will be for some time yet but even if we look historically there will always be an area that outperforms another area for whatever the reason they exist yeah so whether it be because as victor mentioned earlier on government is going to funnel everybody in a certain direction because of the infrastructure that they've just created at the cost of billions and billions of dollars. Let's take Badgerys Creek Airport over the next decade That's a really or so. good example. Yeah. yeah. Actually, even if I expand on that a bit further, even if you go out and just for the people that aren't in the Sydney Basin, if you go out into some of these house and land packages, let's call it into the, the hills or the southwest corridor, traditionally as you start to see the new house and land packages come on, they're at a premium price. So that and when they release three, four, five hundred, a thousand of those blocks with construction, it immediately affects the average price. Then once they've all sold, you'll start to see a retraction in that yeah. growth rate because there's now no new stock that is transacted and it gets back less to activity. Its- Correct. Mm-hmm. Less. So that that pulls into the point about liquidity in the market. It doesn't take very many transactions if the data set is small to affect the data dramatically. Yeah. And you guys have seen it. There's this fist fights for blocks out sort of north northwest um, uh, a- city at the moment. Like, you know, and, and there's a lot more land still to go, right? But it's the, the speed of the release of land. It's but amazing. There's people scrapping on the street over trying to get themselves. Well, they, but up it's, up. Also, it's also in Queensland and Brisbane as well. Mm-hmm. What's amazing, though, if you've just come back to the Sydney example, that it wasn't too long ago, literally 12 months, 18 months ago, well, they couldn't really sell those blocks. No. It's just the activity within the market via the degrees of stimulus is making it happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's a good myth busted. All property goes up in value at the same speed. And they're the secret for property investors is understanding which market's moving at what speed and what market you actually want to be in and which market's going to best perform for you and your particular investment strategy. Outside of the scope of this podcast, we speak a lot about it on Investing Insights Rob Property Group. Go and listen to some of the previous episode. Uh, myth number two here, Stephen, and you sort of touched on it. Valuations always lag actual sales prices. So this is this dichotomy that a lot of investors have where they go, well, I, I bought this place and um, in three months' time, I want to get it revalued at another point and try and release some equity and move on to buy another place, but the valuations don't stack up. It's not always the case, is it? No, it's not, and it works both ways. And we've seen many examples where valuations from two different companies are some 25% difference Mm -hmm. within the space of 48 hours. So it is quite subjective, but generally speaking, valuers can only use the data that's in front of them. And that data comprises of sale results, transactions, agent interaction, and what I mean by that is actually ringing the localised agents up and saying what has transacted that not necessarily has hit the data warehouses and then making an assumption overlaying it with risk, area, supply and demand. So it's actually quite a complex job and a risky job for the valuer to actually put a figure on it. So more often than not, it'll be around on a sales contract, so Mm. what the sales price is. That's why very rarely will you see a valuation come in over contract price. Yeah. So the argument or the the narrative isn't around that. It's for investors, it's usually around, well, I think my property's worth this and I want to extract some equity out of it or recycle capital. Here's what I think it's worth, but the valuer has challenged me or they've said yes or no. And, yeah. and we've all had this. I've had this experience in the smart property portfolio where two 
two weeks different, uh, different lender with a different valuer, completely different valuation on on the property, which was advantageous for us. Is there any way, Victor, that you can positively influence the outcomes of evaluation on a property for the purpose of extracting equity? Not necessarily. So once a valuer has put a dollar figure Mm. on it, it's very hard to get them to change their mind because they have used their set of data to come up with a value. And it could be that the valuer is new to the area or hasn't taken into account the X factor on the property. And therefore, it's got that valuation that he will not move on generally. So, you know, over the 25 odd years of investing, I've probably had one or two valuations that I've been able to successfully challenge, right? Uh, and that's that's the norm in investing because that's the valuer going back to the lender saying, I actually got it wrong, right? And therefore, it taints their reputation in the eyes. And it also comes back to the instruction that the lender has given. Maybe one lender has got way too much exposure in an area. So there's there's risk category that they put on the valuation that impacts it with that lender. Whereas another lender may be very gung-ho in that area because they may not have as much exposure in that area. So they may ignore that risk rating on the valuation. So a good thing would be if you're an investor is to try and get hold of a valuation the written valuation on your property, the full report, and you'll see all of the moving parts within the valuation itself. It's a great, it's it's actually, everybody should do that Mm. just to see what is involved in evaluation and how they write it up. But just coming back to a couple of the points you made then in terms of the lender. So if you take, and we'll call it ANZ today, who are very, very aggressive in the market, and you go to buy a property that has a DA approval on it, or Mm. it may have a granny flat on it, or a secondary income, whatever it may be, Whilst A and Z are very aggressive in the market, it's not their- It's not their flavor. It's not their flavor at mm. all. And they'll dial the LVR back or the valuation mm-hmm. to get the same same effect. So sometimes it's not about the asset, it's about the lender choice yeah. and what their product and their description is. However, if you do want, so that's, sorry, I'll come back. That's where the collaboration with your broker is paramount because they should know all these little nuances mm-hmm. within the product and obviously your property to make mm. the correct decision. But if you are, let's just say, a vanilla, for want of a better word, property transaction that you want to extract your equity out of, and you've owned it for however long, then give yourself the best chance to get the right valuation. So the first thing is never let the valuer go there blindly to establish a price. So you set the price. Create yourself a pack as well, as we've often talked about on the various podcasts, and that pack should include the description of the property, all the data Apples for apples comparable. So these are the same tools that a value will use. Three written market appraisals from localized agents on their letterhead. And if you've done a big renovation, show the before and after photos yeah. and as mm-hmm. well as the spend. That way you're building up a picture for the valuer as to say, I'm actually quite sophisticated. This is what I think it's worth. On the other side of the ledger, though, if your property's worth three quarters of a million dollars, don't say it's worth 1.2. Mm. Yeah. But like yeah. don't get don't go over the top and yeah. this data discrepancy is even more highlighted now with all of the photoshopping of the internet photos that that's done when yeah. the property is initially got a, marketed. A nice warm yeah. fireplace that's and right. all that sort yeah. of stuff. So the valuer doesn't have the actual comparison of what it was and what it is now once you've done the renovation as well, right? So that's why, uh, as Steve said, you need to give yourself the best chance, create that pack and make sure that you or someone that has been properly briefed actually meets the valuer on site. I'd probably say not yourself. So to mm. be your property manager, yep. unless it is owner-occupied or whatever, then mm-hmm. clearly. Mm-hmm. But don't shadow the valuer. Walk through. around going, what oh, about this? What about that? Yeah. Pointing out stuff. Yeah, did you yeah. notice my crystal chandelier? You know, it's it's not going to do any favors. But, but you're never going to know which valuers like particular areas. Like the, It's a bit of a, you're going blind on the value. You, you've got some understanding from the lender's appetite because your broker should know that, but you never know what value you're going to get any given day, whether yeah. they're happy, whether they're not, you yeah. know. And I've something. always found every valuation is like Christmas. You know, they're going to be really disappointed <laughs> <laughs> or, you, yeah. or all your Christmases have, have come at once. It is yeah. that. Yeah. It's a bated breath thing. And, some, and look, this is nothing against valuers because they've got a tough job. Yeah. They've got a limited amount of time, multiple valuations to do in one day, and you know, their insurance, as an example, is very, very high. So they're mm-hmm. – I think just subconsciously they're going to err on the side of caution, particularly in this market. Especially in this Absolutely. market. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. So one of the things that back back in the olden days, you were able to choose your valuer yeah. as to who the valuer is going to be. But now it's all automated. Mm-hmm. So when a valuation request is submitted by the bank, it gets picked up by an aggregator and then farmed out to a valuer that's next in the queue. So you actually don't get a choice with most banks 
as to who your valuer is going to be. Yeah, okay. Well, um, we could probably do a whole podcast on on valuations, but uh, there's one myth busted. Now, another one here, Steve. Um, there's no such thing as a bargain in a hot property market. And by bargain, it's in rabbit ears, inverted commas, um, because whatever you pay for a property is what it's worth. Yeah, but- it depends on how technical you want to be. I mean, the yeah. value of a property is what someone's willing to pay for it. Mm. I think more so the, the answer to the question or the statement is where is the value intrinsically after I purchase it? Is it because I give it a haircut and a shave? Is it because it's zoning? Is it because there's going to be massive infrastructure within the next 12 months, two years, whatever it may be? Mm. So it's not about so much about the value now, even though we'd love to have that and make ourselves feel good about life. Put the filter of 5, 10, 15 mm-hmm. years on it. That's where the true value is. That's a really good point. And, and Vic, how do you go about articulating value to your clients in this particular market? Because in a, a buyer's market, value is seen as, hey, I've got this so far under market value of what it sold recently, whatever. It's quite an easy, tangible thing to prove. However, mm-hmm. in a hot market, realizing value is something very different. It is. It is. And it's all about getting to the front of the queue to control that asset and, and paying not an absolute premium for that property in comparison to the general public, right? But it still comes back to what value it holds within your portfolio as opposed to a generic valuation to say that it's it was a five hundred thousand dollar property normally would it sell for five twenty I've got it for five hundred you know, that that's not value in its true sense the true value is what it will do for your portfolio and your ability to hold on to this property via its cash flow medium to long term that's where true value lies so let's explore that a little further because value doesn't necessarily have to be in its equity position mm-hmm. it could be in what it does to the portfolio via yep. a cash flow position mm-hmm. as an example. But you did mention what it means for your portfolio. So I'll give you an example of what we've done recently where a client bought a 1,000 uh, square meters eight years ago for whatever the price was and next door came up, which then gave us another street frontage at another 1,000 square meters with some zoning. So if he was trying to identify value based on what he purchased for eight years ago, it was going to be a mute point for them. He'd never get past or take that next step. We could afford to pay a little bit more because we could dollar cost average over the two different blocks. So Mm. there's always a set of reasons, if you will, as to how to determine value and what it does Mm. for you. So if you look at that property in isolation, you've probably paid retail on that property, right? But by combining what he's already got and this new property, it further expands his portfolio and puts him in a position where he can capitalize on the amount of land that he's got. So the value wasn't... The value proposition for them wasn't in the purchase price, nor was it in the cash flow. The value was in the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So so value isn't universal. Correct. Okay. So how do you actually understand, appreciate where value lies if you look at it in a linear way, as in price point? Does this come through experience or? It's a good question and you can get lost in the maze of, you know, Analysis mm-hmm. paralysis and decision fatigue, mm. which is you know, probably one of the biggest Achilles heels of an investor. Yeah, I think you've just got to not overcomplicate the decisions you're trying to make and how you're trying to explore the reasons for that decision. And when we start investing, or even maybe just even subconsciously, every property we purchase, we are looking for that equity value or that price mm-hmm. value. But I, I just think if you were, if we'll take today's market, so which is really what the myth was, if I paid full freight for a property six months ago, plus 10%, then today I'm probably still in a circa so plus 15% yeah, absolutely. Pos- position. Now, does that mean that we all go out there and, you know- Overpay. Overpay. Or inverted commas overpay. No, but sometimes a decision mm. needs to be made, especially in today's market where it's not about the price. Once again, it's about the opportunity to control it. And so that may be terms rather mm-hmm. than price. Yeah. A uh, illustration of, you know, overpaying a property- and how it works out medium to long term is if you look back in the um, you know yesteryears, a suburb in Brisbane called Runcorn, where there was the two-tiered marketing, where they got people from Melbourne, Sydney, they, they took them over, bussed them around, and um, got them to buy properties on a Sunday. It was high-pressure marketing. But these guys ended up paying 80 to 120K more than what the property was worth, right? Now, it was all dis- you know, disguised by cross collateralizing the properties with their homes and all of a sudden the because data was not as easy to get to at the time these people overpaid but those that were able to hold on 
and went through one, one and a half cycle, came back in the money on those mm. properties. Now, I'm not, not saying that you overpay by that much, right? But sometimes a thousand, two thousand dollars on a purchase price that allows you to get hold of that opportunity as, as opposed to losing it altogether can make the difference in your portfolio, but it still comes back to affordability, being able to hold onto it long term and how it impacts your overall cash flow in the portfolio. Good that's a good point because you could have you could have the best value purchase on the face of the earth with the best equity position over the next two years. But if you haven't got the cash flow to support mm-hmm. it, you've actually got nothing. Yep. You'll well, be statistics. That's another myth we've got, but we'll go there in a moment. But it, it sounds to me you need to be quite pragmatic in realizing value because only because it's like a Sometimes something pops up, you don't even realize where their value lies. But when you start adding the dots, is when you can actually truly see where that value lies. Uh, another myth here, uh, Victor, which is today's result will set you up for the future. So it doesn't matter how good you are buying at the moment, mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily guarantee success no. over the long term. It, it, does, it does not. Yeah, because you need to be looking at it from a viewpoint of what's this addition to your portfolio do for the portfolio? How does it impact on your cash flow? So it's not all about, you know, buy today, you know, it'll work out in the future. You need to look at it from a viewpoint of, okay, interest rates will go up. I may have longer periods of vacancy. How can I hold on to this property? So it's looking at that, that scenario first, before you start looking at, okay, I'll reap the benefits in the future. A lot of people, particularly with zoning plays, right? A lot of people say, you know, I'll hold on to this for 10 years and then I'll make, you know, quite a bit of money and then you get some sovereign risk coming so an example would be victoria as an example mm-hmm. where they have brought in this uh, legislation where if you get a windfall because of your property rezoning you're paying a lot of state tax or in our circumstances mm-hmm. which we've talked about before yes. you know buying you know, several properties in a development play mm-hmm. and one of those properties was then Re- rezoned yeah. or had a like a heritage listing mm-hmm. whacked on it so all zoning potential development play was gone gone now for us we didn't buy it just on that just on that yeah. that was the cherry on top it's important you, you speak about sovereign risk victor and and we haven't really spoken too much about this on on that podcast so this yeah. is the stuff you can't control no. this is yeah. changes government changes policy changes regulation changes mm-hmm. into the future which you can't even Correct. you can't even plan for or perceive when you buy something could even be a change of a, a road or yeah. you know someone finds a frog um, mm. a, a, some sort of frog that no one has seen for, or a Tasmanian devil, and uh, <laughs> and they go, well, no more development here, yeah. all done. So yeah. you can you scup it. That's right. Yeah. So you can't just look at the, a property that you're buying with a best case scenario. You need to look at it from a standard buy and hold, even if it has a little bit of development twist on it. You still need to look at it from an, a standard buy and hold approach to see whether if everything falls apart, can you still hold on to this property and and not go backwards. Conversely, though, there's the upside as well. Like, mm. Let's not be too negative about it. So that's why we need to cross the T's, yes. dot the I's now. And whether we like it or not, and no matter who it is, if we're looking at it as an asset class over the long term, then we need the cash flow to support it. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And, you know, you, you go back a couple of hundred years when people started buying property, no one would have thought zoning changes would have happened. What we can guarantee is there will be zoning changes into the future, particularly in our capital cities. And then places where you think would never get rezoned, in time, might be 100 years, may be rezoned, right? Well, that's when we start to talk about genera- generational mm-hmm. wealth. Yeah, and that's the hands that, that some people are playing right now where more sophisticated investors, maybe not your first or second property, but a lot of people are starting to think, well, okay, let, let me let me actually have a bit of skin in the game for a rezone play into the future, land banking. Even on a, on a watered-down version of that, though, you know, just, we're starting to see the, the rhetoric again around affordability and, you know, my kids' kids are never going to be able to afford their property. So there's a element of the parents or the grandparents, whichever way it looks like, starting to purchase property to control it for their kids mm. so that they get a head mm-hmm. start or a leg in to the market as such. So I think there's been a, a little bit of a shift from the zoning scenarios there because that's for deeper pockets, maybe more sophisticated investor vehicles. But for the for the mum and dad who are just trying to set their kids up for the future, we're starting to see that a lot in certain areas around controlling the opportunity for the future. Yeah, so that was uh, a myth um, which I think uh, we've busted. Uh, today's result will set you up for the future. The third one is you can't find – there's no such thing as a bargain in a hot market – uh, the second myth that we've busted was valuations always lag actual sales prices. And the first one was all property goes up in value at the same speed in a, in a hot market. Now, uh, Steve, 
this is a myth here, which we've all seen in their own portfolio. Um, we've all considered and had a discussion at some point. Growth trumps yield in a hot market. So capital growth is always better or trumps yield in a hot market. This is the parental debate. Do I want my property to go up in value or do I want it to generate me good income? Mm. We did a podcast last week, which is yet to be released, around investor profiles. One of those profiles, sort of letting, giving the, <laughs> sort of the game away, is the resentful investor. The resentful investor. And the resentful investor emerges based on the fact that they're thinking the sun will always shine, which is really what that myth is about. Because in a hot market, what happens is certain investors say, don't worry about the cash flow, don't worry about the cash flow. Rates are low, but we're getting tremendous growth. So I can actually I can deal with the fact I've got minimal cash flow because I'm just growing at a rate of knots. And that kind of justifies it in my head. However, once we get to normalize growth patterns or even a contraction and rates go up, then what happens is that lack of cash flow becomes very apparent because there's no growth. Then the investor becomes resentful to the property and tends to sell just as everybody mm -hmm. else does the same thing. So I think that you need to take a very balanced approach. And unfortunately, as humans, subconsciously, we always want a piece of the action wherever that action is greatest. But if you take a risk mitigation approach, knowing that we're not going to have these growth patterns forever, knowing that we're not going to have these such low cost of money, now is actually your time to prepare yourself for the future when we do reach that inflection point yep. between growth and cash flow. So look after both ends, bookends. You do need to bookend it. And, and yield, again, is not universal. So It's different for everybody. It's different for every single person. A lot of it to do with your debt. And it's uh, the sixth myth busted here that we hope uh, Victor is part of our podcast today, seven myths. Busted in a hot market. Finance just doesn't matter. Just get it and you can sort it out later. That is probably the biggest mistake most investors can make right now. As in, I just want to buy a place to realize the capital growth. So I'll just get a, a loan and it doesn't matter what the loan is. Mm -hmm. Wrong structure. Uh, we're in the wrong structure. The wrong type of product. Lack of features. Fixed. Variable. Finance really matters in this particular market, yeah, I'd doesn't pro it? I'd probably spin that around a bit to mm. say that most people- are focused and think that interest rate is the first thing that they need to look at. It's probably the second thing they need to look at, right? The real thing they need to look at is how flexible the finance is in relation to the property that you're buying and in relation to what's going to happen in the immediate future in your income generation. So I'm talking about your, your job, right? So if, as an example, you're getting a ultra cheap rate with a lender, but that lender does not support a granny flat construction straight away, Right. Whereas your plan for that property, because you may be transitioning from PAYG into self-employment, is you know you need to actually build a granny flat ahead of time because you won't be able to qualify for a loan down the track. That's the wrong lender to approach based on the interest rate. You'd rather go to a lender that'll actually fund the um, uh, granny flat construction. So that's where the focus needs to be. A lot of people also look at it from a viewpoint of. I'll always be able to qualify for finance, yeah. right? And that's probably the biggest fallacy out there because the, the finance metric changes. As you get more properties under your belt, that changes. As the interest rates go up, that changes. As APRA steps in to regulate, finance changes as well. If you go back to, to 2019, there was a huge change and a lot of investors and home buyers had to sit the sidelines because even though from their household budget they could afford, from the bank's calculator and what the bank was allowed to assess as income was no longer there compared to the previous year. So all of these things do hinge around your plan for finance. And the bottom line is this, right, Steve, we always say this is that you've got to buy the money first before you can buy the property. Well, you've got to buy the debt before you mm. buy the property at, yeah. at the end of the day. But I think the maybe the best way to think about it is that the collaboration between the broker and your property advisor needs to be first rate. Yeah. They need to know what the plan is and the advisor needs to know what the finance is mm -hmm. because the two go hand in hand. Gone are the days, as you say, where it's just any finance will do in any market. Mm. You do want the flexibility because people now are more sophisticated in their approach to investing, hopefully. And there are some products out there that the banks might be willing to give you that I, I just wouldn't touch. Mm. Not because even if it's a, it was a last resort, because of the lack of flexibility yep. in the way they tie yourself in, as well as the fact that it might have detrimental effects to the rest of your serviceability, mm. which is another conversation. Yeah. I think 
at the end of the day, once again, the collaboration between all your key service providers will give you better direction than mm. just you know, any product, any house, any state, any time. Yeah, you've got to look at it from a viewpoint, let's say, and then just painting up a scenario that you've explored all lenders and there's only just one lender or one or two lenders in a third tier lending space that is willing to give you the money. You'd have to look at it from a viewpoint that, okay, if that lender starts increasing their rates rapidly and, oh, I need to refinance because I need to get to the equity or get myself out of trouble, there aren't many lenders willing to lend you the money. So you need to take a long, hard look to say, do I get into this debt or do I give this a miss? Well, go back to the beginning of the conversation around your Bentley and your Escort and the car debt associated with it. Both in white. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but like part of the finance is what you're doing today because mm. your know, money's fairly liquid yep. and the ecosystem that we're in is loose mm. or looser than what it was four years ago. Mm. And there's the government incentives to, you know, 100% write off and all that sort of business for whatever it may be. There are mountains of people that are going into unsecured debt or even semi-secured debt around things like that mm. who potentially m- might be investing now or want to invest in whatever the asset class is, but they're giving no thought to 12 months, two yeah. years, three years down the track and how that is actually going to impact impact them. Because mm. here's where Murphy's Law is going to kick in. You're going to want to refinance. Interest rates are up, but you've got fifty to a hundred thousand dollars worth of yeah unproductive debt yeah. at five times the serviceability rate, and that will be the key to being able to move again or not, mm. or to get yourself out of out a situa- of yep. situation. So, how do you mitigate all that? Be liquid. Mm. Be liquid all the time. One of the things that happens around this time of the year, being the end of the financial year, is a lot of people get into novated leases because the employer starts offering that or the accountant says, you know, you've got to do something about tax. Just get a car on, on a lease. It actually destroys your capability of borrowing more money mm. from a home loan perspective. So you need to map all of that out with a broker first before jumping head first in to do some, in inverted commas, uh, tax minimization. <laughs> yeah, and, and you shouldn't let tax minimization be the catalyst for setting your strategy when mm-hmm. it comes to property investment. Yeah. But we, we won't go into that today. Our final myth here, Victor, for seven myths busted in a hot market. The higher the price, the better the performance. Not necessarily. Not mm. necessarily. Equally importantly, if it's ultra low, you need to also look at the quality of the property as well. But high and low is determined by the price point in that area as to whether you're paying a high price or a low price in that area. And it boils down to a simple thing. It's your affordability. So let's say, argument's sake, we've, we've bought a million dollar property, right? And the yield on that happens to be 2%. Right now, it'll be affordable. So in terms of the interest rate, the differential between rent coming in and the money you're paying out for mortgages, right? It'll it'll probably be about 10, 15, maybe 20K negative cash flow before tax, right? What happens when it goes to 4%, Mm. right? So that's something that you need to be looking at. So it could be that that area plateaus and doesn't move for, say, seven, seven years. For seven years, now got holding cost that is escalating as the interest rates go up. And therefore, it starts impacting on your serviceability to buy further properties. And also, it can come to a point where you've done all of the heavy lifting, you've done everything. There hasn't been a significant movement in pricing so that when you sell that property, as an example, you're not clawing back all of your holding costs. Yeah, I think that maybe the question is the debate between the higher the price, therefore, the inner city rings Mm -hmm. are going to grow at a greater rate than something out in the suburbs. Yeah. And I do not buy into that no. whatsoever. So if we set aside, you know, your own unique affordability piece mm. and just look at what performs better, I just don't buy into that that argument at all. What I do buy into though, however, is that 10% growth of a million dollar asset as a dollar amount is far sexier than 10% growth yeah, of a five hundred thousand yeah. dollar amount, just purely because of the, mm. the numbers. However, if we could put aside the argument one grows better than the other and you could locate the area that they grow equally, then maybe having the same exposure by two five hundred thousand dollar assets, just using numbers here, is far diversification. Is far safer than being all in at a two percent yield on one asset, mm-hmm. maybe getting four percent over two assets with the same exposure, the same rate of growth, two streams of income, maybe you could get funky and get three streams of income mm-hmm. out of it. Then you're in the box seat, however, but 
absolutely do not buy into the fact that one outperforms the other. And especially now that we've seen COVID and how it shifted the trend trends. Shifts. Yeah. Correct. For probably mm. for forever. Mm. But I do believe so that you want that diversification. And if it means bracket creeping, so once you've set that solid foundation, mm. then you can bracket creep up as you become more sophisticated and you look after that bottom line. And this is portfolio makeup. And and when you secure more property, you get the privilege of being able to be a lot more tactical and strategic Correct. about that. But I remember, Victor, um, you've explained this really well in the past, and I'll get you to do it again. Um, everyone always said you need to invest within five and ten kilometres of the CBD, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and to Steve's point around how COVID has changed things forever, your application of that was, yes, that is true, but it doesn't have to be a capital city CBD. And you Correct. always spoke about these satellite CBDs, and we use um, Sydney Basin as an example, Liverpool, Campbelltown, Blacktown, mm -hmm. Hornsby, Penrith, Chatswood. You know, it doesn't matter where they are, but the same logic still applies, right? It does, it does. And, and uh, a lot of times when we're investing, we're just regurgitating, you know, acronyms and we're regurgitating the uh, thought process that most people have put out mm -hmm. in the yesteryears. And if you look at the metrics of before, the employment was in the inner city ring, you know, people with wealth were living on acreage and in the suburbs, right? Mm. Now that's now flipped in the sense that you've got diversification of employment. So you're looking for the employment nodes now. So your Liverpool's, in, if you're talking Sydney, your Liverpool's, your, your Black Towns, all of these areas, they're, they're the employment nodes. Yes, Sydney CBD also has got the employment node, right? So you need to look at it from a population pressure, ease of travel, and it doesn't mean that you know, if Sydney people are comfortable traveling hour and a half to get into the city pretty much on a daily basis, mm. that that's true for Brisbane because they have different traffic patterns, they have different expectations when, when they're living in that state. So you need to look at it from a definition of CBD and the CBD really you need to redefine it as your employment nodes and how far you are from the employment nodes itself. And then maybe overlay COVID now because that's yeah. definitely shifted yeah, the potential trends for the future. And yeah, take Byron, Byron mm. Bay. Yeah, mm. you know, if you were sticking to the ten kilometer radius around CBDs, you'd have never yeah. gone into Byron, would you? And mm. so I think the employment nodes is very, very important, but also the demographic to which it's catering for mm. is very important yeah. as well. Because you mentioned Brisbane, Bi Brisbane's livability metrics, if you will, is far different from Melbourne's, mm -hmm. far different from Tasmania's. Yep. And so trying to approach it with a one size fits all or one rule. Can't be a blanket it's approach. A, it's just craziness. Pretty cool. Well, gents, we've busted a lot of myths there. Uh, I've got the word out properly. Um, and uh, you know, we didn't really touch on it, but one of the biggest myths, Victor, is probably doubles in value every seven to ten or seven mm -hmm. to twelve years. I yep. think it's probably it's the biggest biggest of, there, of yeah. uh, in property investment. Yeah. Properties can double in a year. Properties yeah. can take twenty years to double. Yeah. Right? So it, it comes back to what cycle it is. It, it's uh, you laugh. I'm, I'm, just saying, <laughs> I'm actually, as you said that, I'm actually, I've got an example from in my own portfolio. Of both of those, I've had yeah. one that doubled in twelve months mm -hmm. back in the day, and I've got one that is twenty years on yet. To, it's still not doubling. It's still worth what it was back then. You know, it's yeah. it's an absolute mm. myth, yeah. and that, that lends us to the first myth: all property goes up in value at the same. Speed, yeah, yeah, right? uh, and and I think the, the um the myth about seven to 10 years doubling effect is the fact that it's it's you know a linear approach yeah. of five to seven percent growth each year right mm. now if you um, map that out yes it'll double in seven or ten years yeah but that's not true right we get spurts of growth and then you get flat line or you can go down yeah which then ties in the finance because if you do get a spurt of growth and you want to extract equity mm. or or multiply or do whatever it is if you haven't got the finance correct going back to whatever myth it was well, then you're in a stuck position. Yeah. And for all those people listening, if you've never done this, I've done it. I'm sure you guys have where you can, hey, you can turn $1 into bazillions of dollars in yeah, terms yeah, yeah. of doubling, where you go one turns to two, turns to four, turns to eight. But then it's when you get to like, you know, 10 or 11 iterations of that, the thing just goes berserk. Well, see, right? that's, the, that's the beauty about property. And this is when I mentioned earlier on about being the resentful investor. The, the stats show us that generally speaking, investors hold their property for five years and mm. it's because they've, they haven't made the, the million dollars they thought they would, mm -hmm. or they have, and they're lucked it. But traditionally, they most investors will get out after that market. But yeah. that's just when the, you start to see- You start to see the gravy. Yeah, the initial mm. yeah. seeds of of the the result that you're looking for. It's really after year 10-ish or thereabouts yeah. that you start to see that the rewards 
for your property, the way that I, I speak to everybody is from zero, from year zero through to around about year seven to eight, yeah, expect not expect nothing, but mm. don't get too amped up. It's really yeah. after that that yep. you start to see the fruits. And if you want to have a look at that dynamic, and it's different again, we're talking about doubling, but just go one times two times two times two times two, and you'll see how it just accelerates rapidly. Um, we've done pretty well there, gents. What's what's happening over at Right Property Group these days, Vic? You guys sort of running off your feet as per usual? As per usual. Yeah. Um, we um, do take a um, fairly unique approach in setting up our portfolios in the mm. sense that once someone sits down with either myself or Steve, and we start to buy for them, we do regularly uh, review their portfolio yeah. to make sure that we are correcting for these myths and also correcting oh, for- Oh, that was good. I know, it's a good, <laughs> good plug. Yeah. So correcting for these myths and also correcting for the life circumstances that happen, right? Because uh, your goals are not set in stone. They need to be able to change as these circumstances change as well. So part of our review process helps you do that. Maybe that's another subject is the, is about that and the, and the goals. Mm. I know there's a lot of- stuff out there saying, well, you know, you want to replace your income and that's usually the very first goal that you sit or you you cement in, if you will, or aim for. But I reckon I could guarantee that everybody's goals change within Absolutely. five years. Ours right? have changed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it always does. And if you were to give sense for how, how that sort of process happens, we may and Steve catch up on the Smart Problem Investment Show with our portfolio update where we go through that process to just, you know, re- assess and recalibrate as required uh, in line with the markets, opportunities, being pragmatic about that. So- which I'll need to do another one of them with Steve pretty soon. So uh, watch your space. If people want to sort of connect with you guys, best way, Facebook, yep, uh, website. Send us a private message on Facebook or yep. uh, you can go to our website and uh, click the Contact Us link and um, we'll be in touch with you. All right. Nice one. Well, uh, thanks uh, for that, guys. There's seven myths busted in a hot property market. Uh, some good tenants there to help align your particular strategy. Have you enjoyed any questions at all? You can get in touch with the guys. Questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au. Any question, we're going to do a Q&A episode soon as well. So send them in. We'll uh, line them up and we'll get through them. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consider